Welcome very much. My name is Stellan Lindhagen. I'm a professor of sociology and director of the Resistance Studies Initiative. So uh, the talk we will uh, hear is part of the Resistance Studies Initiative speaker series on resistance. We have one more talk coming up on uh, November 29th by Otto von Busch from uh, the New School in New York talking about hacking. Hacking uh, in very many different forms, not just the internet version, but as well when it comes to uh, lock picking, which is one of his hobbies. Uh, so that you could check out and you can check out our website uh, where we have uh, news about events happening relating to resistance or you can sign up which is the best easiest way on our listserv where you will get information about resistance. We promise to only send things that are related to resistance not just uh, um, whatever kind of things but uh, events and um, well, information, websi websites are of interest. We also over there have some uh, material, particularly our, our journal, the Journal of Resistance Studies, which is a unique one put out by us at the Resistance Studies Initiative uh, two times a year. It's a peer-reviewed international journal uh, focusing on unarmed resistance in all different forms from revolutions to everyday resistance. Um, so if you're interested, you can take, it's free to take a, a copy of the journal, but then um, try to promote it to other people. We, we're really in need of letting more people know that the journal exists and get subscribers. So um, lobby on your libraries and so on to get that. So here's the list serve to circulate. Um, I want to say that we're taping all these talks. Um, and uh, it's only the, the speaker that will be taped, uh, not the discussion afterwards, so don't worry about that. However, uh, if you check out YouTube, our Resistance Studies um, a YouTube series, you can find a lot of the, the, the previous talks that have been uh, happening over the, the different <coughs> years here. Uh, so that's a, a really good resource. We have other resources uh, at our website as well uh, that you could check out. All right, so I think that's enough of uh, propaganda and information about the Resistance Studies Initiative. So I'm very happy and proud to have uh, Professor Nusrat Shroudhury here with us uh, today from Anthropology at Amherst College, uh, talking about resistance in its paradoxes, <laughs> how it, it's expressed in the crowds in, in Bangladesh. Yes. So uh, I'm very curious to hear what you have to say. Uh, after about something, you say 50 minutes or mm -hmm. so, we will have <coughs> open up the floor for a Q&A and discussion. All right? Yeah, great. Thank okay. you. I hope everyone also see that there are some things to take if you're hungry. Uh, and so, just grab. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Stellan and Debbie, for um, inviting me and making this talk possible. And thanks to everybody else for coming. It's a really busy uh, time of the semester, um, two weeks before Thanksgiving. This is when you need the Thanksgiving break. So thank you all for coming. This is a talk that's uh, a little, um, um, I don't want, I don't know how to say it. It's, um, it's not just ethnography, it's not just uh, a kind of literary analysis, and not just theoretical. I'm trying to bring together different parts of the book that's coming out in a few months uh, called Paradoxes of the Popular uh, to give a sense of what I mean by the crowd, uh, both as an analytical category and also as an ethnographic object of study. So the first half of the book, um, uh, sorry, the first half of the paper is kind of situating the crowd in both um, <coughs> literature and theory, and the second half basically draws on uh, my fieldwork, uh, particularly two very small ethnographic examples to make the point. Uh, so if it sounds a little disjointed, I'm, I'm sorry, but I wanted to give a sense of, uh, of the book itself. Um, so I'll, I'll read and then um, we can talk more about it. And if you can't hear me at any point, please let me know. <clears throat> so in August 2006, a small township in northwestern Bangladesh became an unlikely focus of national attention. Tens of thousands of residents of nearby villages gathered at the center of Fulbari, about 180 miles north of Dhaka, the capital, to protest possible coal mining. 
Most of them were there to expel a multinational energy company, then called Asia Energy Corporation, that was planning the country's largest development project. Three men were shot to death on August 26th in the confrontation between the paramilitary guards and the angry protesters. We are not discussing politics, we are discussing energy. One burns and the other creates. A local organizer joked loudly, deliberately it seemed, in order to be overheard. We were walking out of an activist meeting in Fulbari a few months after the agitations against possible mines became violent. The activists' comment at first sounded like a neat allegory of the heightened crisis around energy and democracy, marking Bangladesh's entry into the 21st century. The young man's words, however, were more than a clever summary of the urgencies on the ground. They revealed a curious and counterintuitive valuation of energy, Jalani, and politics, Rajniti. Said with more than a touch of irony and loud enough for others to hear, the activists' words were especially telling within the stifling political climate of a nationwide emergency that was declared in early 2007. Protests in Fulbari that were interfering with the glib rhetoric of foreign direct investment and development were under strict state surveillance. Spies, or low-ranking agents of the state security apparatus, followed around a renowned public intellectual with whom I had tagged along on my first trip. As we were paying visits to the families of the wounded or killed in the 2006 shootings, the mobile phones of the organizers kept ringing. I counted at least 10 phone calls asking after my name and other coordinates of identification. A meeting at the local press club was abruptly adjourned because of a warning issued by a security agent who was hovering at the doorway to see us out. The freshly minted emergency power ordinance and emergency power rules banned any activity deemed political and allowed for arrests without warrants. Energy fit into a patently toothless rhetoric of sustainable development, but politics was suspect. Its seeming abjection had invited the military-backed technocratic government. One burns and the other creates. In everyday use, however, energy is what is supposed to burn, producing power as a valuable byproduct. The etymological intimacy between the Bangla words for energy, jalani, and jala to burn, highlights the paradox at the heart of the comment namely politics taking on the role of energy. The former's once creative potential was now relegated to a natural resource like coal that was widely believed to forestall an energy catastrophe. Politics burned, though producing nothing but ruin. Talking about energy in the bazaars and tea stalls was acceptable, while political organizing around it was subject to state scrutiny and at times tough intervention. Within a few months of the emergency, a confrontation between the students and army jawans at the University of Dhaka campus led to one of the most powerful oppositions to the caretaker government. Thousands of students and a number of their professors at public universities were jailed for instigating what appeared to be contagious violence. Despite the ruthless treatment by the state, the student protests revealed the first cracks in the facade of the military government supposedly without political ambition and therefore corruption. In 2013, a much larger crowd gathered at the heart of the capital city, hardly a mile from the university campus. With an elected government firmly ensconed and another national election on the horizon, the country was in the throes of an urban and admittedly middle-class uprising in Dhaka. At a busy crossroads named Shabag in one of South Asia's most crowded cities, a group of young activists, some with party affiliations and many without, came together to challenge an early verdict of the International Crimes Tribunal. The Awami League government that had assumed power in the wake of the emergency set up the ICT. It had vowed to try the alleged collaborators of the 1971 War of Independence as part of its campaign promises. A long time in the making, the legal body had been at the receiving end of both warm praise and trenchant criticism. Many rights advocates and family members of the victims of war crimes had been demanding fair trials for the individuals responsible for siding with the Pakistani state and committing or abetting in war crimes. They saw in the founding of the ICT justice long delayed. The actual workings of the tribunal, with its various procedural loopholes and allegations of political appointments, made it one of the most controversial governmental steps in recent memory. 
All three uprisings mostly took shape outside of party political structures. The scope of the protests was not delimited by organizations or institutions. They have been public in the sense that they took over public spaces for their articulation. In this, they have been formally akin to some of the spontaneous assemblies that dotted different parts of the world this past decade. The protests in Bangladesh, whether against corporate capital, land grab, military rule, or war crimes trials, defied easy labeling, their form and content veering between progressive, secular, patriotic, religious, reformist, violent, radical, and reactionary. As bookends to the Fulbari coal movement, the student dissent during the emergency and the protests that came years later in Shahbag highlight the scope and the constitutive paradoxes of popular sovereignty in Bangladesh. In this paper and the larger book of which this is a part, I foreground paradox at one level to account for these historical and sociological contingencies that have generated a curious mix of optimism and despair a distinctly, distinctively post-colonial combination where the early zeal of anti-colonial nationalism has been routinely banished to the waiting room of history. At another level, I do so in order to attend to the foundational contradictions within popular sovereignty, of which the crowd is an exemplar. The paradox of peoplehood begins with the very act of representing the people, which has always been a fiction. Its very existence required a suspension of disbelief. Edmund Morgan has shown in the seminal Inventing the People. And I quote him, before we ascribe sovereignty to the people, we have to imagine that there is such a thing, something we personify as though it were a single body, a collective entity more powerful and less fallible than a king or than any individual within it or than any group of individuals it singles out to govern it. The shift in cosmologies which made possible a transfer of power from the king's two bodies to the people's two bodies sustains a number of contradictions, such as the fact that the people are actual subjects as well as fictional sovereigns, and that not anybody or mere people, as Morgan would say, can constitute the people. Its sovereignty must not be confused with the unauthorized actions of individuals or of crowds. Still, protesting crowds have been the media of meaningful change in the democratic culture of Bangladesh as in many other places. The effects of these political collectivities spill over the boundaries of well-defined political projects. Established power and its opponents harness crowd potential, even as it frequently betrays both. As an agent of politics, the crowd has been the much-touted nemesis of the people and the public in scholarly treatises on democracy and public life. Theories of popular sovereignty in the Marxist or liberal normative tradition, as well as their critiques, are dotted with a figure whose energy surpasses the demands of democratic politics. It is at once a force to exploit, an entity to denigrate, and more, other, more often than not, a symptom of shifting social and political conditions. Jody Dean voices a familiar leftist lament when she says that by reducing autonomy to individual decision, we destroyed the freedom of action we had as a crowd. And yet, Dean admits to the crowd's constitutive volatility and its limited freedom in becoming a possible unit of politics. Even when the crowd's breach of the predictable and given creates the possibility that a political subject might appear, and this is Dean's words, the crowd, instead of having politics, can only be an opportunity for politics. In the long durée of writings on the political, the crowd is a permanent fixture against which the acts and utterances of the people are defined. Popular politics in South Asia, be it revolutionary or nationalist, has long relied on the power of the crowd, as have counter-revolutionary forces from the colonial to the contemporary. From vibrant rallies that rouse mass affect, to oppositional tactics of hurling homemade bombs to kill as many ordinary commuters as possible, the crowd is both a solution and a scapegoat, and in that sense, a true political pharmacon. Indeed, in Bangladesh, crowds, mithil or processions, and political gatherings have played formative roles in the origin story of the nation. The crowd at Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's speech at the Ramna race course in 1971 is a significant part of national folklore. Nearly a million people had assembled on the afternoon of March 7 to hear the leader. They chanted Joy Bangla, victory to Bengal, and waved Lathis to signal their readiness to fight. 
The event that was led by the future first president of Bangladesh was a grand moment of declaration where the boundaries between popular demands for independence and constitutionalism were blurred to produce one of the most iconic moments and sound bites of East Pakistan's struggle for nationhood. Mahmudul Haq's novel, Jibon Amar Bon, Life is My Sister, which was published in 1972, starts a few days before Mujib's landmark speech. The war begins and ends within the Bangla novel, which is narrated in the third person. Jibon Amar Bon is largely about its central character, Khoka's struggle to make sense of the events that were sweeping away the region, and with it, a whole generation. It is a tale of the main character coming face to face with what he likens to a force of nature. Khoka calls this unreflexive, uncouth, and hysterical entity by the name Jonota, which is the Bangla term that I'm using as an equivalent for the analytical category crowd in English. So I'm quoting from the novel. To Khoka, what was until then a skinny word wrapped in the wispy feathers of three letters, like Doita, beloved, Jamini, night, or Modira, wine, is suddenly spreading across the city in thunderous explosions, Jonota. At the outset, Jibun Amar Bon is a story of a 22-year-old college graduate, casually ignoring the political urgency of his time. His family's bougainvillea-covered house in the East Pakistan capital and collection of books bespeak upper-middle-class comfort. His friends are young men with whom he studies, smokes and drinks, and argues passionately. There are also a few women, specifically a married lover, but others too, whose advances he lusts and loathes. Koka tries his best to keep them away from his younger sister, Ronju, the space of innocence in his life. Koka doesn't recognize the power of history amidst which he finds himself. His deep disgust for any sign of its strength makes Hawke's novel an unusual document of Bangladesh's birth. It is, however, an ode to the crowd as a political actor in the event of national independence. Jonota, not Koka, is the motor of history. When Koka ignores the rumors of a military attack on civilians, or when he mocks the spark of nationalism in his friends, he denies the Janata sovereignty. He fails to see reason in those who are occupying the streets, demanding political rights, or fleeing the city en masse. Koka himself is fleeing the crowd throughout the novel. Its dialectical movement forward ends in tragic synthesis. The crowd stampedes an ailing Ronju, his younger sister. She was his only surviving kin, whose adolescent innocence kept him sheltered from the riffraff of the outside world. The charging crowd was the same Jonota whose power Koka had denied all along. At the end, it also sweeps him away, literally, when running from an advancing army. We see glimpses of the paradoxical nature of popular sovereignty in the long internal soliloquies of Hawke's protagonist. It's not easy for Koka to go with the flow like the others. The whole business of politics, or Rajniti, to him is utterly gorgeously slutty. With equal chauvinistic disdain, Koka vo notices naive schoolboys who still wipe their noses in the back of their hands while taking political lessons at street corners. He calls the on-strike tannery workers guinea pigs and questions their newfound political consciousness. And yet, a deafening noise interrupts his thinking. A roar, yes, a roar is getting louder and louder, crashing in the air. Koka places his ear against it. The noise is fast becoming a grumble. What Noah's flood is this? Koka asks. So Janota as crowd is an active, affective, and political configuration of manush, which is the word Koka uses for the people. The Sanskrit-derived gloss for the human can be either singular or plural. Manush hawa is the process of growing up. It's a progression towards becoming a fully functioning human adult. It is at once developmental and social, like in the expression manushkara, to bring up a child. But the word doesn't pack a political punch in the same way Janota does. Manush speaks to an innate humanity that need not include political maturation or participation. Janota is a higher level of collectivity than the mere passive Manush. Koka highlights this disjuncture by comparing people to its abject other animal. We have animals are only ever eager to become full animals. At every opportunity, we want to avow that animality with a roar, he says to his politically inclined friend. The becoming political of the people is also their becoming fully bestial. The beast has Jonota perplexes Koka. His disgust is palpable, as is his denial of its power to come together and multiply. 
His hatred for either Rajniti politics or Jonota crowd is not familiar middle class apathy towards mass politics. No doubt, South, South and Southeast Asian political cultures mirror the hierarchies of a deep-rooted class society. When Shudipto Kaviraj coins the hybrid term public to denote the creative uses of public space in Calcutta, or Vicente Rafael observes the cell phone toting pro-democracy crowds in Manila, or Lotta Hook notes the coming together of the Mufassal and the metropolis in Dhaka, they show in vivid detail how public life is riven by socioeconomic distinctions. If anything, Koka's discomfort echoes the recurring ambivalences around the crowd in scholarly work. Those who have written on and during political upheavals in the West in the last couple of centuries, especially in interwar Europe, have taken a keen interest in the category. The crowd and the Jonota, as tokens of mass political entities, overlap and diverge in revealing ways. At the center of Koka's universe is Ronju, his younger sibling. At its edges are other characters, like Koka's lover, who is the wife of an older friend, a cousin who tries and fails to romance him, and an independent professional woman whose character, or lack thereof, is the talk of the town. Koka verbally abuses the women, as well as the crowd, and considers them mad. Ronju, the asexual infantile girl child, is the exception. Between Ronju and the world, Koka wants to stand guard. Nazmul Sultan writes in an engaging commentary on the novel. In Koka's imagination, the boundaries of women, licentious men, and a boisterous crowd start to blur. By the end of March 71, Dhaka goes under the control of the army. Koka gives in. He leaves the city with Ronju, but only to sacrifice her to an onslaught of people. As Ronju dies under the feet of the Janota, Koka is forced to become a part of it. All he wanted was for Ronju to live, but Koka doesn't know that that's where he is wrong. This desolate country would never give Ronju the sole right to live, he soon learns. The Michil or the procession and the crowd has a catalytic role in another piece of fiction from the mid-1970s. Ahmed Safa's well-known novella, Onkar, the Om, reaches its climax in 1969, and like Jivun Amar Bon, unsettles a rehearsed story of Bangladeshi nationalism. Here, too, the march of an insurrectionary crowd coincides with death. The relationship between the two is less direct, though equally poignant, as in Hawke's novel. Omkar begins a couple of decades earlier with the reminiscences of its unnamed narrator. Unlike Koka, this young man is of modest means. He owes his livelihood to a rich and hawkish father-in-law who is as good at defrauding others as in being all too familiar with the military regime. It's his mute daughter whom the main character marries in exchange for a job and a comfortable life in the capital. In 1969, the protests against the military dictator Ayub Khan had spread across East Pakistan, leading to deadly violence. In the political trajectory of Bangladesh, 1969 reflected the most congealed form of contentious politics. For the first time, Bengali nationalism became a primary motive in the mass agitations that were gaining steam in East Pakistan and successfully joined forces with insurrectionary left politics that led to the toppling of Ayub Khan. The People's Uprising became a precursor to the war that broke out two years later. Assad, a student leader who was killed at a rally in 1969, is now considered one of the first martyrs of independent Bangladesh. These were restless times. Mujib was in jail. Processions were everywhere. The protagonist narrator of Onkar embodies this restlessness as he shifts his gaze away from the posters on the walls and towards the sky. He keeps to himself, though unlike Koka, more in fear than disgust. Every little thing makes him nervous. Yet he knows he has been deluded. Someone as inconsequential as he could never be the target of the hatred and anger of the thousands. He says, I cannot stand processions. I lose my hearing as soon as I catch the noise of slogans. I lose all perception. It feels as if the procession goers are hitting me with a thousand sharp arrows. As soon as there was an incoming Michil procession, I would shut the doors and windows by habit. While he covered his ears, it was his wife who opened the doors and windows at the first hint of a marching crowd. She struggled to understand what was being said. The sound of a Michil was a magnet to her inner being. Noises burst out of her without provocation, while an uncanny presence took over her body. One day when a procession was approaching their house, her happiness was palpable. 
she moved to its beat as if possessed by a jinn. The pieces of words that she struggled to form, which used to come out as little cobblestones, now rang different. A realization hit him. She too was trying to utter Bangladesh that wafted in from the procession. With a sudden jolt, his mute wife leapt up. No sooner had the first intelligible word Bangla came out, she started bleeding in the mouth and fell unconscious on the floor as if, nothing, if something inside her tore into pieces. I stare at the stains of fresh blood on the floor and at my unconscious wife, and the only one question comes to my mind, whose blood is redder? Is it Assad's or my mute wife's? Safa writes in the last line of the novel. Both stories then end in cathartic sacrifice. The sacrifice, albeit accidental, is of the self for the sake of the collectivity. The two female characters are tragic victims to what Safa calls the storm of time. While Khoka's sister is killed by the crowd, the mute wife manages to echo the crowd by uttering her first meaningful word that is the proper noun of a yet-to-be-born nation. The two male protagonists, their self-appointed guardians, realize the urgency of history too late and lost what to them was the most treasured. Their inability to see the power of the crowd cost them dearly. The role of the feminine in the narrative resolution of the stories demands a closer look. An obvious place to start are the concerns over female hysteria and the beastly behavior of the crowd that hover over notable 19th and 20th century writings on the masses. Sigmund Freud, uh, Freud and Gustave Lobo have famously taken a psychosocial approach to understanding the popular. In Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego, Freud engages with Lobo's influential late 19th century text that elaborates on the hysterics of the crowd. The crowd is compared to the so-called primitive, the infant, the barbarian, and the feminine. In other words, the quintessential markers of the other of Western rationality. The mass, it would seem, has always been the eclipse of reason, an enemy of a well-ordered police. There are still important differences between the two famous decoders of crowd psychology. The category in Lobo and Freud's studies doesn't necessarily denote the same thing. Freud's crowd, compared to Lobon's urban working classes, is a far more encompassing epithet. The opposition posited between the crowd and the individual, the former being the bearer primarily of passion and the latter of reason, is more complicated in Freud than what first meets the eye. The crowd here is not the antithesis of individual rationality. Rather, individuality is an effect of repression, sublimation, and inhibition of psychic drives. As Jacqueline Rose would later say of Freud's work, we are peopled by others. The crowd and the individual, therefore, are one and the same. The former is a window onto a society not yet encumbered by power, where institutions or authorities have not stabilized human passion. On the feminine, however, Lobo and Freud's voices are more in concert. Passions supposedly drive women. Passions are also the constitutive elements of crowd action. In losing oneself in the crowd, one indulges in feminine behavior that is out of control. Individuality is a masculine phenomenon and the masses a feminine one, Frederick Jonsson adds when commenting on what he calls the stock item of mass psychology and its fascination with the crowd. The question of gender and crowds offers an added challenge when posed from the vantage point of South Asian public political life. Within the sizable expanse of South Asian studies, one finds a quintessentially masculine, if not male-dominated, crowd. Sociologically speaking, the South Asian crowd and its imagination don't easily line up with the gendered thinking that has informed classical European literature on the masses. Among the ethnic rioters across South Asia's cities, I'm thinking of Stanley Tambaya's work here, the unruly peasants in colonial Uttar Pradesh in Shahid Amin's archive, or the mourning fans at the funeral of their favorite film star in Dhaka in Lotta Hook's ethnography, we see crowds as men. They participate in protests or celebrations, the styles of which are culturally tied to young men. Fun or jouissance marks the urban masses ever present in rallies, communal showdowns, cinema halls, and religious functions. They enjoy certain comfort in and control over public space that are not available to many women. While this may seem applicable to Western crowds as well, I would argue that the South Asian crowd tends to be at once empirically male and, in an ideological sense, masculine gendered. 
So in my description of crowd politics in the remaining paper, I will speak about words, actions, and characters that were not often the most striking or even at least seemingly the most significant. Despite the spectacular nature of these political assemblies, the figure that appear in and out of view were frequently lost in crowds, stood at the sidelines, or came together by accident. Hearsay, more often than direct communication, formed the basis of their reminiscences. So back in Fulbari, consider this story that I had heard even before setting foot in the mining area. It concerned the physical assault of a young man who had traveled to Fulbari from the capital with a documentary film crew. He was the younger brother of a well-known filmmaker who had sent his team to gather footage of the protests that flared up in 2006. While shooting the film, he was unsuspectingly sporting a t-shirt with the logo of a film festival with the word Asia in it. Asia, by then a name familiar due to the presence of Asia Energy, the energy company, was enough to anger the crowds. They attacked the man on suspicions of working for the company. Influential activist leaders had to intervene to save him from public wrath. Later, when I spoke to a woman who was a part of the crowd, she remembered vividly. We would have killed him. The situation was such that we would have killed him. If each one of us had hit him, he would have been dead. I asked her if she had seen the t-shirt, to which she replied with equal excitement, yes, they looked like they had no life left in them. They came with cameras, they knew someone, two other leaders had to verify if he was someone from energy, she used the word energy in English, or if he was only wearing the t-shirt. The same sign that was found on an outsider's clothing was also familiar as the corporation's logo. The crowd that vandalized the company's office and attacked its employees had located on the body of an urban youth a dangerous icon, which was not read the same way by all, if read is at all the right verb in this context. The woman confirmed seeing the t-shirt, but most likely didn't know the meaning of either Asia or energy. She used energy in English as shorthand for the company's proper name. Together, these words and actions cohere as what I describe as imperceptible politics. This is the politics that arises from the emergence of the miscounted, and I'm quoting, those who have no place within the normalizing organization of the social realm. Attempts to harness and work with these imperceptible potentials are generally misrecognized and translated into the given terms of representation. The concept, imperceptible politics, also has significance, I believe, for understanding political crowds. It is no mere coincidence that mobility refers to movement, but at the same time to the common people, the working classes, and the mob. The escape of which Papadopoulos and others write is surely about dissent and construction, but it's not, or not always, resistance. It is comprised of everyday, singular, unpretentious acts of subverting subjectification and betraying representation, a strategy that cannot be reduced to one successful and necessary form of politics. These everyday cultural and practical exercises of escape are what I document here as the politics of the crowd. So my first ethnographic example. A working class woman from the Fulbari township, whom I shall call Majeda, was party to the burning of cash as protest. Majida was already quite a celebrity when I met her in Fulbari. In, in 2006, she, along with a few other women from her neighborhood, had come out on the streets to challenge the brutality of the border patrol guards that had led to the deaths of three men the day before. Interviewed multiple times by journalists and activists who thronged the area following the killings, she was by far the best known representative of the women of Fulbury, a potent and eminently utilizable token of local resistance. An op-ed article, first published in 2006 and reprinted on the same date next year, had the following to say in a section titled simply The Women. And I'm quoting, it's rather ironic that a woman who has been utterly neglected by society, who is detested by and large for not being honorable, was the first woman to strengthen our social cohesion. It was she who prompted other women to come out on the streets too. In plain English, she is a prostitute and often remains outside of Fulbury on business." Unquote. The activist cited here iterates two well-known facts about Majida, her political participation and her profession. 
She was one of the first to have come out of her house with a machete to confront the paramilitary. Majida's profession, though not so subtly handled in this piece, was a public secret. My research assistant and friend, who's a local resident in his late 20s, who was a good friend and a confidant, went to great lengths to euphemize what Majida did for a living before giving a name to her profession. So this is Majida. I put Hussein's house to fire, she said abruptly, interrupting her husband's reminiscences of the events from a year ago. Hussein was the one who fled first, you understand? He left on his motorcycle. Why would I run away if there was no weakness in me? Her husband asked rhetorically. That was when Majida intervened. I put Hussein's house to fire. Her husband tried in vain to change the course of the discussion. Undeterred, she continued. Then Hussein's house was put to fire. The sack of money burned down. At last, when there was a light wind, one could only see the seals on the notes. Addressing the older woman standing at the doorstep, she nearly shouted, he kept money in the turmeric. Our conversation at the time of her interjection focused on how to tell if someone was a collaborator or a traitor. Locally known as a dalal, a collaborator was a ubiquitous figure in Fulbari, rife as it was with suspicions of profiting from the energy company and its myriad forms of corruption. Hussein was suspected to be a collaborator whose house Majida um, put to fire. The audio recording of our exchange is hard to decipher with Majida's voice drowning in the parallel conversations taking place between her husband, the older woman, my friend and myself. It's not clear if she said he kept money in the turmeric or if he kept money as he would keep turmeric. It's a productive confusion either way. In both cases, Majida was describing a sack that was a shockingly improbable place for storing money. The shock was comparable to a television public's collective awe at the spectacle of hoarding cash during the emergency government's anti-corruption drive, particularly in a, in a forest officer's house who hid money under his mattress and in drums of rice. In both cases, there is an indecent mixing of bad money with foodstuff, where the latter signified distinctive use value. A farmer from a nearby village Kofirul further affirmed the point when he explained to me their collective sense of betrayal. All they want is money, and they here means the company, the government, and their allies. We will stop supplying the paddy. Now whether they want to eat money dry or eat it by soaking it in water, it's up to them. Hiding money with food grains for people whose livelihood had been integrally tied to the latter's production made hoarding much more scandalous than simple accumulation. Shrill and almost jovial, Majida's voice betrayed both the shock and humor at this scene of plunder. The first sentence, I put Hussein's house on fire, claims individual agency. When she repeated the assertion, then Hussein's house was put on fire, the sentence assumes a collective agent. It applies an indirect and passive form to simple past tense that in most cases identifies the speaker as a member of a group. The reason behind the switch in the narrative register, passive substituting for active, had at least partially to do with the careful policing by her husband. There was no accounting for how people thought at the time, her husband added as a justification for the act. His wife got caught up in the events. The thoughts of the vengeful had no rational coordinates, thereby displaying the quintessence of crowd behavior. The reason behind Majida's clear excitement in seeing the fire was not simply that money could be stored like com condiment. Money, when put to fire, also burnt in flames like any other object. How did you know that there was money there? I asked her. In response, she almost repeated herself. Because all the sacks burned down, only the seals were there. If you blew lightly on it, the sack would be all ashes. She went on to describe how the ashes were flying around in the wind, showing enough proof that the bills had indeed burned down. What was offered as the ultimate evidence was the seal, for which she used the English word, the symbol of paper money source of authority, its national indexicality. The seal is the hidden, if enduring, feature of bank bills issued by national treasuries or state banks. For Majeda, this was visible even when the rest of the bill was consumed by fire. In the absence of ritualistic immolation of bank bills to be found in other cultural settings, Majida's use or abuse of paper money was a political act lodged in a system of meaning that tied productivity with morality. 
This explanation still doesn't completely account for Majida's excitement or joviality in telling us, a couple of strangers, the story of being in that fateful crowd. Money, we must remember, is also fun to play with. And here I'm thinking with Bill Maurer. The magical or fetishistic nature of money is routinely brought into relief by the fact that magical tricks themselves often have money as a favorite prop. So what kind of value did Majida reveal or restore by burning down the money at Asia Energy's office? In the most mundane sense, what was revealed in Majida's act were the acts of betrayal by the collaborator, Hussein, who had kept sacks full of money in his pantry. Majida's joining the pillaging crowds in this burn-off stemmed from anger and grievances that she had nurtured because of the violence committed by the state on their bodies, neighbors, and kin. More generally, there's something more profound and fundamental about spending that cannot be identified with a calculation, planning, or goal orientation in a commonsensical conception of resistance. Unlike in mass destruction or consumption, in the kind of expenditure described by Majida, there's always something left over, some excessive element, some energy that is burned off and that sets us afire, says Batai. The remainder, literally, was locatable in the ashes flying around in the wind. Equally important, Majida's excitement and humor spelled out an excess of energy that was not fully recuperable in a familiar script of popular protest. Michael Tosig tells us that when the human body, a nation's flag, money, or a public statue is defaced, a strange surplus of negative energy is likely to be aroused from within the defaced thing itself. What he calls negative energy is similar to Georges Bataille's concept of heterogeneous energy. In the energy regime in Bataille, ritual or sacrifice entails a production and consumption of energy that is not stockpiled or quantified in the same way as are raw materials or energy resources used in industrial societies. It's different from the homogeneous energy, which is merely the power to do work and generate apparent order. The energy stored in and released from a strip-mined mound of coal, for example, is qualitatively different from the bodily energy discharged at the contact of an eroticized object. Money, no doubt, falls into the category of potent things that can be defaced, as do many other symbols of state power. So Georg Zimmel has famously drawn an analogy between the erotics of prostitution and the money form. Of all human relationships, Zimmel says, Prostitution is the most striking instance of mutual degradation to a mere means. This is the most fundamental factor that places it in a historical relationship to the money economy, the economy of means in the strictest sense. This is Simmel. This particular episode from Fulbari adds a different meaning to the so-called isomorphism of the two. No more a mere means, Majida's burning of cash elevated both her and the money she had burned from their purely generic content Another common feature Zimmel identifies between currency and prostitution. Their individual distinctions were produced anew by an act through which the identity of the collaborator was sealed while that of Majida's was refashioned. She transformed and transcended her previously established role as a public woman, albeit as a part of a crowd whose ability to reason and efforts at seeing was suspect. Caught in the midst of an emergent crisis of representation, when allegations of collaboration saturated the public sphere, through this collective act of plunder, Majida created value as an individual as well as a member of a protesting crowd. So I move to my second example. When I had asked Majida about how she became involved in the movement, she said it was only because she saw a local patron being beaten by the police. In other words, she said her entry into politics was accidental. It was a sister's duty towards her brother, she said. As an analytical framework, accident provides a particularly vantage point from which to appraise how and why Majida had become a powerful token of Fulbari's revolutionary women. The recuperation that had happened in her case, however, was continually denied to another person whose life was also tragically and accidentally tangled with the same events. I'm referring to Torikul, or more specifically his mother, with whom I had the opportunity to speak. Torikul was a 20-year-old man from Fulbari who was one of the three young men killed in 2006. He was a part of a procession that was trying to get to the office of Asia Energy and eventually confronted the paramilitary. 
In contrast to Majida, Torikul was the son of a well-heeled member of the local elite whose role in the mining issue was at best dubious, as was widely believed by my politically active friends. Among Fulbari's elite, local government officials and big land holders and business owners were most support, mostly supportive of the mining project. Poor peasants, often with little or no land, small traders and laborers, such as Majida or her husband, and some indigenous groups opposed the mines due to the potential loss of land and the insurmountable problems they generally face receiving compensation in the absence of proper documentation and powerful kin or patrons. Torikul's mother, in spite of being the mother of a martyr, had failed to become a part of the resistance culture. The suspicions around her husband's alliance with the mining company tarnished her public profile as the one who sacrificed her son as the one who sacrificed her son. This despite the fact that the martyr's mother is a quintessential mourning subject. It didn't suffice in guaranteeing her an elevated status in the representational economy of the movement. In Torikul's mother's narrative of her son's death, accident was the single operative theme. It overwhelmed her version of how her son had become a victim of the day's events. Torikul had no desire to join the procession. He was there only to see what was going on. After all, it was not every day that 40 to 50,000 people, and some would say many more, congregating in Fulbari to attend a public meeting. In the midst of the chaos, his cell phone fell out of his pocket. As he was about to pick it up, a member of the paramilitary guards, BDR, Bangladesh Rifles, that has been renamed since, shot him. He had, not, had he not bent down to retrieve the phone, he would have been alive. A minor accident of a phone slipping out of his pocket eventuated in a fatal accident that was to become a critical event. The young man, as per his mother, was only accidentally a part of the crowd. The role of the cell phone in setting off a deadly event could not be underestimated. From artistic representations to popular remembrances, Torikul's mobile figure distinctively. The phone, as a source of the accident, became the pivot around which sentiments and actions took on their respective shapes. The cell phone was the cause of Torikul's death because it stopped him from leaving the scene of danger in time. The accident, it seems, happens when ordinary communication fails, as is signified by the misplaced cell phone. Still, as an inanimate object and lacking agency of the kind ascribed to human actors, the cell phone's role in the fatality was accidental. This in no way diminished either its power or its significance, both of which were noted by Majida and her husband. So her husband said, the son of the commissioner was killed. I heard his mobile fell off. Majida says, that was it. It fell from his pocket, and when he went to pick up the mobile, the BDR thought he was about to throw stones at them. People couldn't stand the BDR. They used to throw stones at them. He was going to run away, and the mobile slipped off. He was about to pick it up, and they thought he was picking up a stone. The people there who were dragging away the boy, they are the ones who told me. I only heard it from them. Like any accident, Torikul's death too was a culmination of missed cues and misrecognitions. When he bent down to pick up the phone, the paramilitary thought he was picking up a stone to hurl at them and reacted preemptively. Majida could offer this explanation because she had heard eyewitness accounts of the course of events. The source of Torikul's misfortune was still a matter of speculation between the couple who relied on hearsay to come to terms with an inconceivable accident. Throwing stones or rocks at the police and other state agents was as common in this agitation as it has been elsewhere in Bangladesh and South Asia. The gesture is generally recognized as a counter-hegemonic, albeit violent and potentially dangerous strategy that crowds employ when faced with an enemy of unequal force and might. Often it's a mere tool for evoking reaction or getting attention from the powers that be. In Shahid Amin's thick description of Chauri Chaura, stone hurling features in a subtle yet significant fashion. Chauri Chaura was the site of the peasant violence of 1922 perpetrated in the name of Gandhi, which in its own way changed the career of Gandhi and the course of Indian nationalism. Dissimulation was at the heart of that incident as well. Facing a crowd that just attacked a police station yelling death to the red turbine bastards, the watchmen and constables were running away while shedding visible markers of state power, red turban, uniform, sticks, and belt. So this is, I'm quoting from Shahid Amin. Siddiq ran for another six miles to the next police station and filed the first report on the riot. 
Badri scurried out half clad and picked up a fistful of stones to appear like your average rioter. Jyodhan threw off his uniform and turban and went out with stones in both hands, pretending to be one of the rioters and calling out, hit him, hit him. Fulbari Storikul, however, was no average rioter. Devoid of any express political will, according to those who outlived him, he was a bystander who got caught up in the motions and was in a hurry to leave. The simple act of picking up a phone looked like it had a subversive motive. The accidental seemed intentional and in turn solicited violent intervention. As Majida's husband pointed out, Torikul had a more privileged social standing than most of the people who were a part of the protests. This made his death less than ordinary. A young boy of a rich father could only find himself in the middle of this stone-hurling crowd by accident. It had made his death all the more tragic in the eyes of Majida and her husband. The line between death and martyrdom is rarely settled. From the unintentional martyrs in Palestine who were killed while carrying groceries or looking out the window, to the suicide of Muhammad Wazizi, the fruit vendor in Tunisia, the making of martyrs often has little to do with their own intentions. As the crowds in Tunis, Tahrir Square or Fulbari for that matter have made evident, martyrdom is ad hoc, improvised, uneven, contentious and precarious. Had Torikul survived unscathed from the day's events, had he been able to come back home like thousands others, would Torikul have become conscious of a coherent political project? It's impossible to know whether and how this curiosity and attraction to spectacle would have set the stage for future politicization. Beyond his mother's lament of his untimely death and the ascription of martyrdom and retrospective inclusion of Torikul in the core script of the movement, one can only speculate the possibilities that exist in such exposure to situational convergences that may and indeed have led to political awakening for other people in other places. The interpretive possibilities raised in the thematic of the accidental demand that we take them seriously. Rather than symptoms of deeper truths, they are constitutive elements of a culture that makes itself known in this space of contingency where things happen. <coughs> What the discourses of accident also offer is a fresh way of thinking about the affect and intimacy of crowds. It gives us a renewed appreciation for the way ordinary people, such as Majida and Turigul's mother, experience the political structures of global commerce and the state through sensation, emotion and personal experience. The impersonal and excessive nature of crowd politics, as we have seen, also generates intimate moments through which politics is embodied and performed by those on the fringes, bystanders like Torikul and those quote-unquote disreputable like Majida. For the latter, the discourse of accident was also a means of negotiating a moral self. I agree with Rosalind Morris that the potential force of an accident depends on the recognition that it cannot simply be relegated to the past because accidents can happen any time. Accidents, as Morris admits, may not be the model for radical politics, but surely if my ethnographic accounts are anything to go by, Recognizing them as accidents can be the ground on which a progressive political future may very well be envisioned. In this understanding of the political, resistance extends beyond insurgencies and public unrest and into a state of mind where affect and accidents <coughs> converge with powerful and lasting effects. Doing so is not the same as rehashing some hoary revolutionary myth about the crowd. This is not an attempt at finding in the crowd the direct expression of a unified and sacred popular voice, but instead approaching it as a living image and a potent political representation. It is to ask when and how a numerical minority of individuals physically gathered in a public space can be understood to speak and act on behalf of a superior but forever disembodied entity called the people. It is also ultimately to interrogate what animates the popular that evokes hope and despair about the fate of democracy itself, particularly the post-colonial versions of it. Thinking beyond South Asia, how does the ephemeral ordinariness of the crowd contrast with the populist resentment that has become a prominent motive in understanding democratic politics globally? What happens then when we start with the crowd and the possibilities of politics that it opens up or forecloses as constitutive of not only South Asian political modernity, but understandings of publicness everywhere. What happens when we start thinking the public sphere, as Frank Cody has urged us to do, from an illiberal perspective, 
which would entail making the libidinal, corporeal and poetic ties of kin and community and not the empty stranger citizen as a starting point. I guess that's a question with which I end. Thank you. Thank you.